Thank you all for coming. I'm pleased to introduce Dan Ports, who's a professor at the University of Washington, where he leads the Distributed Systems Research Lab. Research group. Uh, he his primary focus is on distributed systems uh, in a modern scale data center, and he works on making them more reliable, more efficient, easier to use, more secure. Uh, and uh, with this work, he's had lots of papers uh, in uh, OSDI, SOSP, NSDI. He's had a couple of best paper awards even. Uh, and with him being just across the lake uh, with several students, uh, he. Is his, he is a, a good source for potential collaborations in the future, so I'm very pleased to welcome here to, to him here to give a talk to us, and I hope you'll all join me in welcoming him. Thanks, Jay, and thanks everyone for coming. It's uh, great, great to be here, and I'm excited to tell you about some of the things that uh, my students and I have been working on over at UW. So I've given this talk a bunch of places, and usually I need to start out by convincing people that distributed systems and data centers are relevant to their lives. So I'm guessing this probably isn't a place where I really need to make that case. Uh, but indeed, you know, our applications these days are being built in dis the data center, which means that we have to build them as distributed systems. And we do that because our applications you know, are just too big to fit on one machine. We need them to be scalable to huge data set sizes. We increasingly need that data to be constantly changing by interactive processes. So we need the system to be able to respond quickly uh, within a few milliseconds. And we need them to be more reliable than a single computer because users expect their applications never to go down. Which means that application developers have some really hard problems to face about how to build systems that are, in fact, scalable, fast, and reliable. They have to be able to build reliable applications, even though at the data center scale, there are always some servers that have failed. They've got to handle massive levels of concurrency, uh, which we've always had problems dealing with concurrency, even on a single machine and race conditions. But now we're asking developers to handle millions of concurrent users constantly updating data. And they get an even harder problem that is specific to the distributed systems context, which is that when there are multiple copies of data, um, either for performance reasons or for reliability reasons, these copies might not all be the same. So uh, they have to reason about all the possible states that the data could be in and how to keep that data consistent. And you know, all of this really leads us to what is kind of the paradox of distributed systems, that we were building these things because we needed our applications to be faster and more scalable and more reliable than a single machine. But we've got all these problems, and if we don't get them right, we're going to wind up with something that is slower, less scalable, and even less reliable than a single machine, or even completely incorrect. So, there's an opportunity for systems research to help developers build uh, reliable and scalable distributed systems with practical uh, system software. And specifically, I'm going to talk about building storage systems that provide strong guarantees in order to simplify application development. And I'm specifically referring to two things here. One of them is strongly consistent replication, where the system is going to make multiple copies of a data object and making sure that they're always going to be the same, even when there are concurrent updates and failures. And that's really great for developers because they don't have to worry about the fact that there are multiple copies of their data that, that are constantly failing. They can just treat it as though there's one copy that's always up. And then the second one is distributed transaction support where developers can group operations into transactions and have the system uh, making sure that they're executed as an atomic unit, even when the data is stored in different places, so they don't have to worry about concurrency and race conditions between the components of a transaction, and they can imagine that only one of the transaction is running at a time. These aren't new ideas, of course. They have been around for uh, many decades, uh, but traditionally, uh, these abstractions impose a really high performance cost, and that leads application developers to be stuck between a rock and a hard place 
because they either have to have these nice guarantees but have a system that's potentially not going to scale and not going to meet their performance requirements, or they're going to have to architect for high performance and go to a lot of trouble to deal with all of those distributed systems challenges that I was talking about before. So this is where my group's research fits in. We've been building practical systems to make it easier to build distributed applications by having strong guarantees it, with low performance cost. And we'll show in some cases that this can give us uh, strong properties with very little or no overhead. So we've done this in a lot of different areas. Um, fault tolerant replication, transactional storage systems, new types of applications like in-memory caches. Uh, I've also done some work in the past in serializable transactions and conventional databases, um, including the concurrency control mechanism that's in the Postgres database that uh, many of you may have used. In this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on three systems. Mostly I'll talk about fault tolerant replication with two systems called speculative Paxos and network ordered Paxos. And then I'll talk a little bit about some uh, ongoing work we have on building distributed transactional storage uh, in a system called Eris. All of these systems provide uh, strong replication and strong transactional guarantees with really low overhead uh, that is uh, close to indistinguishable from systems with weaker guarantees. And what is making all of this possible is that we're using a new approach to designing our distributed systems by taking advantage of the unique properties and capabilities of the data center environment. So the plan for this talk is that uh, to give you a bit of an overview at a high level of this approach first, and then we'll look at two case studies of this in the context of fault tolerant replication, uh, and then have a brief uh, look at how we can use this for the harder problem of building uh, distributed transactions in a larger scale storage system. So if we start from the really high level view of distributed systems, if the data center is our unit of computation and we've got all of these communication and failure challenges in it, we need to be able to use, just, we need to use distributed algorithms to make sure that the system provides correct and reliable behavior in spite of the fact that there are many nodes, some of which might be failing. The canonical example of one of these distributed algorithms is Paxos, which many of you are probably familiar with. If you're not, it's an algorithm that's used to deal with failures in distributed systems by having a consensus protocol that makes sure that the nodes agree on the state of the system, even when some of the replicas can fail and when the network is unreliable. We're seeing this used everywhere in data center applications today, both for keeping critical services available, the things that manage and coordinate the other systems in the data center, and we're also seeing it being used as the basis for persistent storage in distributed databases, uh, in addition to or sometimes in place of writing data durably to disk. You see this, for example, in, in Google Spanner. So, The high-level way that we generally build distributed systems is to first model the environment that we expect them to run in, and then design a distributed algorithm like Paxos that has the properties we want, and then we'll go and build distributed systems that use this algorithm to imp implement a real system. And traditionally, these steps are done by completely different people, uh, and sometimes they do this you know, decades apart, we Paxos and related algorithms were originally developed in the late 80s and early 90s, and we didn't really start seeing them being deployed in uh, even research systems for five to 10 years and practical systems uh, until maybe 10 years ago uh, when we started having large data center environments. So what that means is that the model that people use when designing these algorithms doesn't always closely match the, in today's environment in the data center. So what 
I mean by this is that distributed systems are traditionally designed completely independently of the network that they're running on. And that means that the algorithm designers treat the network as some kind of black box where they have to make really conservative assumptions about it. So a standard one is the asynchronous network model where we have to treat the network as an adversary that's causing arbitrary packets to be lost, delayed, reordered, or potentially even modified in some other way. And that gets used in algorithms like Paxos and is responsible for a lot of complexity there. So that's a totally reasonable thing to do in the internet because we know that all of these things can and do happen, and there isn't really a whole lot we could do about it anyway. But the question is, is this really uh, the right approach for the data center? Because the data center network isn't a mysterious cloud. It's at, we actually know quite a bit about the data center network. It's a structured network that's designed to provide certain properties. In fact, the data center network really is fundamentally different than the internet in a bunch of different ways. So for one thing, it's a more reliable network. Obviously, we do have failures in the data center network and packets being lost, but it's really happening at a different scale than it would be on the internet. And there's a potential to make the net data center network a lot more predictable because we know the topology and the routes that packets can take in it. But most importantly, uh, there's a lot more flexibility in the data center network. It's being run by a single organization so that you can imagine actually making changes to the data center network in a way that you really can't do in the wide area internet. And then on the technological side, you've got modern networking hardware that has some pretty advanced processing capabilities that you can take advantage of. And increasingly, these capabilities are being exposed to application developers and administrators through technologies like software-defined networking. So what that means for us is that we've got a new opportunity. Uh, for the first time now, we can really start to think about co-designing the distributed systems with the underlying data center network. So that's what we, my group has been doing. We've been looking at how to build new distributed systems using this approach, which is to say that rather than making worst case assumptions about the data center network, We'll try to understand the actual properties it has in practice, but also to engineer new network primitives that give us new properties in the data center network, and then build algorithms that are specifically designed to take advantage of these properties in order to give you better performance or better re reliability. So our first set of work in this area has been with fault-tolerant replication. And this is joint work with uh, my students, uh, Jalin Lee, Naveen Sharma, and Ellis Michael at UW. Uh, and we've built a, a couple different systems here. These are addressing the problem of dealing with failures in the data center environment. So server failures really are the common case, not the exception. They're constantly happening. and the standard approach that we use is some form of replication, like state machine replication, for critical services. Conceptually, this is really simple. We're just going to take a service and make multiple copies of it on different replicas and uh, make sure that they're all executing the same operations in the same order, which means that even if some of these replicas fail, the remaining system can still handle client requests. The challenge here is to make sure that they are, in fact, processing the same operations in the same order. And that's the standard way to do that is with an algorithm like Paxos. And we're going to, I'm going to talk about how we used our co-design approach to improve the performance of Paxos. So in order to do this, we first need to understand how it works and what the performance bottlenecks are. More importantly, as a distributed systems researcher, federal law requires me, whenever I have this many people in a room, to explain Paxos to them. So we're going to do that. Uh, it has a reputation for being really complicated. But in fact, in the normal case, it's conceptually really quite simple. We've got a set of clients that are submitting operations to a group of replicas. We've designated one of these replicas as the leader and made it responsible for ordering requests. 
And of course, we've got a protocol for how to elect a new leader if it should fail. Uh, and when a client sends a request, it goes to the leader, which assigns it a sequence number, and then sends it off to the other replicas, which will send back an, an acknowledgment if they're prepared to execute that operation. This is a two phase, it looks like a two phase commit protocol if you're familiar with that. And once the leader has heard from a majority of replicas, it can go ahead and execute the operation and notify everyone, including the client, of its successful outcome. So the important things here are, one, uh, for correctness, that we had all of the operations assigned a consistent order by a single point in the system. Here it's the leader. Uh, and of course, a lot of complexity comes in later in making sure that if there's a failure, we maintain that order. And then the other important part is that nothing actually gets executed until a majority of the replicas have seen them, which means that if there's some failure of, a mi of less than a majority of nodes in the system, we can recover from that. So just by looking at this graph, we can see a bunch of the important performance properties of Paxos. Um, in terms of latency, there are four phases to this protocol, four message delays. In terms of throughput, what we've seen being the limiting factor in practice is the number of messages that need to be handled by a bottleneck server. Here it's the leader, which has to process 2N messages. And we're going to be able to improve on both of these, both in a theoretical sense and in an empirical sense by co-designing co uh, with, with a data center network property. So how are we going to do that? Well, we saw that Paxos was using a leader replica to order requests. And the theme for both of our projects in this area is asking, can we use the data center network instead to uh, do this kind of ordering? And we've actually done this in two different systems. Uh, the first one was a system called Speculative Paxos and Mostly Ordered Multicast. This was in NSGI a, few, a couple of years ago. The, what we did in this work was to engineer the network to give us this primitive called Mostly Ordered Multicast, or MOM, which has a best effort ordering property. It gives you a, a certain property in the common case, and then we really exploit that common case to build an, an incredibly efficient replication protocol called speculative Paxos. Later, we built a system called network ordered Paxos or no Paxos on top of a more complicated network primitive. And in this work, what we were doing was not trying to provide a common case, but to provide an actual guarantee by taking advantage of some new advanced processing capabilities in data center network hardware that let us have a simpler and even more efficient protocol called network ordered Paxos. Both of these systems give us some nice performance results. So speculative Paxos was the first uh, replication protocol that could outperform uh, existing systems on both latency and throughput at the same time. In the past, you generally had to choose between trading off one for the other. And network ordered Paxos uh, not only outperforms speculative Paxos, but it's able to give us state machine replication with less than a 2% overhead relative to an unreplicated system, which means that it's possible to uh, avoid this traditional trade-off between strongly consistent replication and good performance. So let me start by talking about speculative Paxos. And as I said, this project was all about the common case. So what we wanted to do was to make sure that we could provide a certain ordering property called mostly ordered multicast in the normal case, and then design a replication protocol called speculative Paxos that was optimized for that common case. So what is the ordering property that we wanted? Well, what we'd really like to get out of the network is a consistent ordering of concurrent messages which is to say that if we've got multiple clients sending messages to the same group of replicas, and one replica gets operation A followed by operation B, then we'd like them to all get A followed by B. You can see how having this 
would really simplify your, your life if you're trying to implement replication. And indeed, if you actually could achieve this in a fully reliable way, you wouldn't even need any of the complexity of a replication protocol like Paxos. Uh, but in order to actually achieve this, you have to solve a problem that is in fact equivalent to consensus. It's nearly impossible to get it right in the event of network failures. So what we found was a reasonable option instead was to provide this as a best effort property, which is to say that it holds most of the time, but the network doesn't guarantee that it's going to provide it all the time, it, say, if there are failures. And that's going to make this something that's actually practical to implement. But I should note that existing data center networks and existing multicast protocols certainly don't provide this property already. So we can see this if we look at an example. Um, here we've got a really simple data center network where we've got three clients talking to three replicas via a network that consists of uh, five switches in a, in a multi-rooted tree configuration. This kind of topology in some form is, is very common. Obviously, in a real data center network, you'd have a lot more switches and a whole lot more servers. But we can see, just looking at this, why uh, reordering of packets would become a problem. The reason is that multicast packets will take routes of different lengths and potentially different levels of congestion, and that can lead to replicas getting messages in a different order. So if we've got this client on the left sending a message to all the replicas, it's going to arrive at replica one before the other two replicas because it only has to travel a path of length two versus a path of length four to the other destinations. And similarly, if the client on the right is sending a message, it'll arrive at replica three before the other two replicas. So you know, it shouldn't be too hard to imagine that if these messages were being sent at around the same time, that some of the replicas would be receiving the blue message followed by the red message, and some of them the other way around. And that's exactly what we wanted to avoid. So in order to address this, we used a bunch of network engineering techniques to reduce the probability of this happening. And the main one is, rather than ta always taking the shortest path directly to each of the replicas, we're going to first route the multicast messages through one of these root switches that are going to be equidistant from the receivers. And that's going to normalize the path lengths. So now, if this client is sending this message, rather than taking the direct route to replica one, it first travels up to the root switch and then back down. And that means that all the paths have the same length. There's a lot less variability in the message delivery time. And although it's not a guarantee, this means the chance of having a packet reordering turns out to be a lot lower. Now, if you step back a little bit, what we've done here is actually something that's really counterintuitive. We're asking the network to take longer to deliver certain packets, which is something you'd never want to do if you were designing a network in isolation. But we'll see in a minute that when we combine this with our co-design protocol, we get a system that has better overall latency. Jeff? Yes. Could you go back one, one slide? Yep. Before you were talking about the ordering with respect to the purple uh, messages and the right. red messages, right? Going up to the root of the, the routers there doesn't really help you with that at all, right? In, in terms of the ordering between the two sets. So. Each message will individually be routed uh, through the root switches. And that means that the window of potential reorderings becomes smaller. Uh, it's certainly not the case that this certainly doesn't guarantee you that there will be no reordered messages. But uh, empirically, the likelihood of having a packet, having you know, one of the replicas get the red message and the other the blue message and one of the other replicas the other way around drops by a couple orders of magnitude as a result of this. But, but the purple message would, would flow up to the router on the right, right? Yes. Right. Does that clear it up at all? Or? Um, yeah. Um, OK. It, 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 I understand that it reduces in practice, but given that the two routers are independent and all the messages that flow down from them are also independent. Right. 
you would think that there would still be a lot of reorderings between the red and the purple when it gets when it comes to the, the replicas, right? Uh, so the, definitely there are some, uh, and we'll see a little later that in our next system we can eliminate we can really eliminate them. Uh, here, what we're just trying to do is to reduce the probability. Uh, so this is really kind of an empirical approach okay. uh, that we're able to bring it down from potentially one percent to more like point point oh one percent or less. So what we can do with that is design speculative Paxos, which is a new state machine replication protocol, uh, provides the same properties as Paxos and actually the same guarantees, which is to say that even though we're going to rely on this ordering property for performance reasons in the common case, we don't actually rely on it for the protocol to be correct. So you know, as Ricardo noted, you can in fact get packets delivered out of order and the speculative Paxos protocol is totally resilient to that. It remains correct and provides the same correctness properties as Paxos. So the actual protocol here is really quite simple. What we do is have the client just send the message to, directly to all of the rec replicas using this new network primitive. And each of the replicas will just assume that it's likely the other replicas got the message in the same order, so they'll speculatively execute it and respond to the client. There are a couple of details that we need to include here to make this work. Uh, one is that when the replicas respond to the client, they're going to include a hash of their current state, which means that the client will be able to check for matching responses from enough replicas and uh, if, it, if it gets enough, then it will know that the operation has successfully executed. Uh, for technical reasons uh, related to fast Paxos, if you're familiar with that, we actually need to use a larger quorum size than you would in traditional Paxos here. Uh, two thirds or three quarters of the replicas rather than one half. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that we've dramatically reduced the complexity of the replication protocol. Before, we were talking about four message delays to complete an operation, and here we only have two. Uh, in terms of throughput, we don't have a bottleneck replica anymore. Each replica is processing you know, only one incoming message and sending one response. So we're pretty much at the theoretical minimum here, um, which means that, you're, as, as we'll see in a minute, this gives us some nice a, a substantial improvement in both throughput and latency. Now. What's making this possible is that we had to use speculation, uh, which is to say that replicas are executing requests before they know the definite ordering. And that does mean that they might have to roll back operations if they didn't execute the, them in the right order. This isn't practical to do for all, of the, for all applications. It happens that there are a lot of things you would want to replicate in the data center where it's not too much trouble to achieve this, like in version storage systems. But one really important property we do have here is that the clients always know that their request succeeded because they can compare the responses from the replicas and only take enough matching ones. So the clients don't need to speculate on the responses, which is important because that's a lot harder. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, yeah. uh, is it possible that the driver or the NIC reorders the packets? Uh, how are you ensuring that they don't? Yeah, we have actually seen that. Uh, a, a problem in practice that the NIC will try very hard to keep packets from the same sender arriving in the same order, but not to provide the kind of ordering you okay. need. So we'd have to disable receive side scaling in order to do that. Okay. And what does that? Do? I, I guess you know what does that do to the overall throughput? That's the question. But the other question that I have is, uh, what happens for commutative operations? You'll get a match for reordered things, right? I mean, that's not really like the ordering that you want, but uh, it's identical so output. So we actually use, in this case, the, a, a hash chain of these operations. So you can think of a hash of the log of all operations. Uh, so you would, in fact, detect a reordering. If you had commutative operations, you could likely use a slightly different mechanism to you know, not detect uh, reorderings that you didn't care about. But we haven't, you know, we haven't done that specifically. Yes. Uh, so who uh, decide here to roll back the operation because now you are sending them? Exactly. So that's the next part, which is that the replicas aren't normally talking to each other. So 
how do they make sure that they're in the same state and know when they need to roll back? And in order to do that, they periodically run a synchronization protocol every you know, few thousand operations or every uh, few milliseconds where they just check to make sure that they're in the same state. And if there is a divergence, they're going to run a reconciliation protocol. And this looks a lot like the slow path of standard Paxos or a view change in view stamp replication or raft where the replicas are all going to pause their execution, stop processing new requests, elect a leader, and exchange the log of operations. And then this leader is just going to decide on the correct ordering of these operations um, in a way that's consistent with anything that might have returned to the clients and notify the replicas of the proper order. And this then requires some of the replicas to roll back and re-execute the requests. This is a pretty expensive process, both because of the rollback and because we have to stop the system while we run this process. But so that's actually, this, this goes to show the, the co-design approach, which is that we have a really fast common case and a really slow um, uncommon case but we're going to a lot of effort to engineer the network in order to make this uh, uncommon case rare. It only happens when the ordering property is violated in the network. Is there any way for you to have a limit on how far you have to roll back? Yeah, that's a part of what the synchronization protocol does, which is to periodically make sure that you're in the same state. And if you are, then you can you know, throw away your speculation <laughs> records because you won't have to roll back how further. Far in your experiments, have you, how far did you keep that log back? Uh, so we've generally kept this uh, a couple hundred operations. It, obviously, it would depend on what the operations yeah, so actually are. So in, ter in order to understand the performance of this system, we built a emulated data center network in our machine room uh, by connecting a lot of switches to each other in a with, with an awful lot of very short cables, which uh, did not leave our IT people very happy with us. Uh, we, this emulated data center network uh, provides mostly ordered multicast. And we've compared a variety of existing replication protocols on this system. So here, we're comparing them both in terms of latency, where uh, lower is better, and throughput, where better is to the right. So first, the obvious comparison is between a standard Paxos algorithm. And actually, here I'm referring to uh, a multi-Paxos leader-based uh, approach, which is the standard optimization you would use. This is also equivalent to view stamp replication or raft, if you're familiar with those. Um, and speculative Paxos gives us four times the throughput uh, and 40% lower latency than this standard Paxos approach would would do, which is a pretty nice result on its, by itself. But to really put this in context, we can look at kind of what the existing best practices were in terms of optimized protocols. And traditionally, you had a choice between running a latency-optimized protocol like Fast Paxos, which gives you better latency but not actually any more th throughput, or running a throughput optimization like batching requests uh, which would give you much higher throughput at the cost of additional latency. And uh, this is actually a variant of batching that's designed to minimize the uh, latency, latency impact. So with speculative Paxos, we're able to give you the best of both worlds, which is that we can give you better latency than fast Paxos, and without, while still giving you the, the throughput benefit that you would get out of adding batching. Uh, so that is a ni really nice performance result there. So just to summarize this speculative Paxos work, this was our first foray into co-designing protocols and data center networks. And we showed that we could achieve better throughput and latency than traditional replication protocols by taking advantage of the engineered network in the data center. And an important thing to note here is that this is actually something you can deploy today because it just requires some simple changes to how packets get routed, which you can do with existing software-defined networks. But we wanted to do better than this. And 
So the question we started asking after we had finished this work was, well, speculative Paxos was all about the engineering the network for the common case. Yeah. So why not just emulate the latency in software? Why uh, route them differently? Because that has yeah, that, that's definitely a possibility, that you could delay a packet in software rather than routing it along a lower path, a longer path. Uh, we didn't do that because the latency isn't always fully predictable on congested links, and also that there isn't There is additional bandwidth utilization as a result. No, no, I meant uh, if you're saying that latency is not predictable, that also means, potentially means that these queuing uh, delays are different across different paths, even if the path lengths are the same. Right. So how does that affect the system? Uh, that, that does, uh, I, I think after path lengths, queuing effects are probably the largest factor. Uh, for certain applications, you can avoid some of the queuing effects by using quality of service. Uh, obviously, that comes with a, a set of trade-offs that are kind of obvious in whether, whether you can actually prioritize the traffic ahead of others. Uh, it's practical for a lot of coordination <coughs> metadata services. Uh, and actually, if, if you're interested in this, you can take a look at uh, our NSDI paper, which uh, actually evaluates the impact of a few different design options for how you would do this and what that means for the reordering rate. You know, using one switch, multiple switches, quality of service, no quality of service, that kind of thing. Yeah. So how much of a performance drop do you experience with turning off receiver side scaling? Uh, we haven't... We haven't had a... Uh, that, that hasn't been the limiting case for... Uh, the, re the state machine replication because uh, we are using an architecture here where ultimately the requests have to be have to be serialized and then executed by a single thread. So having them ha having the NIC deliver them in a single queue uh, is is not having a huge effect on uh, overall system throughput. Okay, but then, but then you're not multiplexing that hardware. Correct. You, you know, what we would really like is a way to have um, packets destined for the same replica group go to one queue, but different replica groups go to a different queue. Uh, that's not something you can do with RSS. A clarification for your answer to uh, your question. So your, your NSDA paper actually does have analysis of the overhead on the network. Of, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, we did that in simulations with a data center network uh, using um, <coughs> workload measurements from a Microsoft data center study. So in this, suspected of Paxos was all about the common case, but we wanted to start asking afterwards, can we get actual ordering guarantees out of the network and use that to build a simpler, uh, more efficient, and more robust uh, system instead. And the thing that's making this possible is that there's a new generation of data center switches that are coming out that have flexible data plane packet processing architectures, which essentially mean that you are allowed to do a really small amount of computation in the switch on every packet, uh, which means that you get this computation really for free as the packet traverses the switch. And so we started asking, you know, can we use this to um, do part of the uh, replication processing for us and get a simpler protocol. The result was what we called network ordered Paxos or no Paxos, which makes it possible to replicate systems with essentially no Paxos performance overhead. And this was a paper from OSDI uh, last year. So the obvious question in this work is, if we want to use the network to do something, what should we have it do? So we can look at this as a spectrum of network guarantees. On one side, we've got the traditional asynchronous network, which is, provides no guarantees in the network and requires the full complexity of something like Paxos. And then at the other extreme, and I put speculative Paxos you know, just to the right of this, because it's only giving us properties in the common case, no actual guarantees. At the other extreme, you could imagine having a totally ordered and completely reliable network. And that would be a really great world to live in uh, because at that point, 
you wouldn't have to run any replication protocol. You just send the messages and the replicas would just execute them and do exactly the same thing. And the problem with this, of course, is that there's no real way to implement this other than like you could imagine trying to push Paxos directly into the switches and um, guarantee uh, reliability that way. But that uh, is going to be inefficient and definitely trying to do something in hardware that it's really not suited for. So the question we were asking in this work is, you know, is there a space in the middle of this spectrum where, you know, using our knowledge of how these replication protocols work, we can find a model that actually provides performance benefits, but at the same time is something you can actually manage to implement efficiently in a data center. And of course, since I'm talking to you about this, uh, the answer is yes. Um, our proposal was what we called ordered unreliable multicast, or OUM. And the key idea here was that in state machine replication, we needed all replicas to process the same set of operations, which is a reliability property, and process them in the same order, which is an ordering property. And in a traditional design, the replication protocol is responsible for both, but our key idea is to separate the ordering from the reliable delivery so that the network is responsible for the ordering guarantee and the replication protocol is responsible for rely providing reliability. So the reason I'm arguing that this is a practical approach is that there's a fairly straightforward way to implement this. That is, we designate something in the network as a sequencer. Uh, this could be a, one of these flexible packet processing switches. And it has a really simple job, which is just to uh, put sequence numbers into packets. So it's going to maintain a counter for every replica group. And we're going to configure the network using OpenFlow or something like that to forward all OUM messages for a replica group to the right sequencer, which will just increment the sequence number, write that counter value into the packet header, and send it off to all the receivers. And then once you've got these sequence numbers, uh, the receivers can just look at them to detect when messages were reordered based on out of order sequence numbers, or detect drop messages by noticing gaps in the number sequence. Under it. Shouldn't sequencer also be an agreement? Uh, so we're not gu guaranteeing that the sequencer is reliable. So uh, it's just a single point of ordering, but not a reliable one. So what happens if the sequencer fails? We'll talk about that in a bit. But we resolve it in the protocol <laughs> sure. level. Uh, fundamentally, well, what we're saying here is that adding this sequencer in and the sequence number is going to change our network model uh, just a little bit uh, in that, it's no, that it, it, it's no longer a totally unordered network, but it has an ordering property. And this is going to give us some really nice properties when we go to design a replication protocol for it. So in a, just to give you an example of how this works, here we've got two senders sending multicast messages concurrently using OUM. And Messages get forwarded to the sequencer, which stamps them with the next counter value and sends them off. In the normal case, the receivers can see that they're receiving the messages in the right order. But there's no guarantee that all the messages will be delivered. So this one, for example, doesn't make it to the middle replica. But when the next message comes along, that middle replica is going to see that it got messages 1, 2, and 4, and it will know that it must have lost message number 3, and that means it'll send a notification to the application level code, our no Paxos system, telling us that that message was lost. So why is this going to be useful? Well, from the perspective of a replication protocol, first, the network is already ordering the messages, so we don't need the replicas to coordinate to agree on that order. And second, we've got this drop detection property where Replicas will know that they've lost a message, and when they do, exactly what message was lost. So the protocol only needs to explicitly coordinate when the messages actually get lost. Now this lets us build the, a an even a really simple protocol for how this works uh, to do replication. So clients just send the request to all the replicas with OUM, and in the normal case, 
Since the message the network is guaranteeing ordering, the replicas will all receive the request in the same order and immediately reply back to the client. The client is going to wait for a response from a majority of the replicas, including the leader. And this has the performance properties we saw in speculative Paxos, which is to say that it's, there's no coordination between the replicas and the optimal two delays for latency. Uh, but it's also less expensive than speculative Paxos because we're able to eliminate some of the more expensive things we did there, like speculative execution and comparing summary hashes uh, because the network is giving you this ordering property uh, rather than just a best effort that could potentially fail. Obviously, though, there are a lot of ways things can go wrong here. Uh, when there's a message that's lost, this gets detected by the network layer based on the gap in sequence numbers, but we still have to recover from it. And the way we do this is by having the non-leader replicas ask the leader if they receive the missing message. The leader replica, if it's missing the message itself, will run a coordination protocol to that looks like a single round of Paxos to get the replicas to all agree never to process that message and move on. The nice thing about this protocol is it's lightweight. Uh, in particular, if one replica misses a message, the other replicas can continue executing the other operations while it gets caught back up. We don't have to do this thing we did in speculative Paxos, where we had to stop the system in order to sort out what requests we should be doing in what order. And again, that's because there's an ordering guarantee here, whereas there wasn't before. As you said, there can also be failures of, this, of the sequencer as well as the leader. And the way we deal with this is by uh, replacing the leader and running a view change protocol it, and in the uh, no Paxos layer that makes sure that all the replicas are in the cons a consistent state. That is to say that they're going to detect the failure of a sequencer and when stop to agree on what the old sequencer successfully did and then start processing requests from a new sequencer. I won't go into all the details of this. You know, we have a paper that explains the protocol and proves it correct and all of that. What I do want to mention is how do we implement the sequencer? And there are a few different ways. Uh, the most efficient way would be to take advantage of switches as a sequencer, which has essentially no cost since the packets have to go through these switches anyway. And these programmable switches are able to execute this uh, as part of their existing processing pipeline. This is something you can do. We've implemented in P4, so you can deploy it to some upcoming switches that are becoming available this year from Barefoot and Cavium and others. But we don't actually have these switches yet, so we've built a prototype in the form of a middle box using a network processor, which is a specialized uh, piece of hardware for low latency packet processing. We connect it to the root switches. It's giving us the same functionality, but it has an additional latency cost because the packet has to be transmitted to this device. Yes? Are there in the total system, usually? So at any given point, we're only using one. So but would it be a bottleneck? Uh, in general, we're only using that one sequencer for a particular replica group. And the amount of traffic destined for that replica group is going to be a lot slower than the capacity of a switch. You can use a different sequencer for different replica groups. So the end result is good performance. So we can revisit this graph we were looking at before uh, and add in no Paxos. So we've got even more of a performance improvement now. We're up to a 4.7x improvement in throughput and uh, close to a 50% reduction in latency relative to classic multi-Paxos. Um, this is also throughput that's 25% higher than your uh, batching throughput optimized version of Paxos with one sixth of the latency. But to put this in perspective, we also compare it against an unreplicated server that's just doing RPCs to a single machine and not providing you any fault tolerance at all. No Paxos is able to get you a throughput that's within 2% of this unreplicated system and latency that's within a few microseconds with uh, most of the additional latency cost coming from the fact that we had to use this middle box prototype rather than an in-switch sequencer.
Smart. Maybe we'll talk about this. Can you comment on how do these class of out uh, protocols interact with SSL? Uh, they don't. I think is the answer. Uh, these are protocols that you're running inside the data center. I was hoping that you thought about it. I'm hoping you have some magic bullet where you can actually, even with SSL, you can do something. Afraid not. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, fundamentally, there's a problem here yeah. because we're talking about multicast uh, datagram protocols, and SSL is very connection oriented. So uh, we've got a fundamental disconnect there already. I'm not aware of people generally, you know, SSL encrypting this kind of traffic, although certainly there are reasons why you might want to. Yeah, Ricardo. So, so uh, have you looked at the impact of the background traffic on the network, on the performance of especially uh, speculative uh, Paxos? Yeah, so this is an issue really for speculative Paxos, uh, not so much no Paxos. Right. Uh, unless you get to congestion losses. Right. Uh, definitely there is an impact there. It's, it's pretty sensitive to how the network, it, the network utilization and that sort of thing. Uh, quality of service helps if that's a possibility because that gives you more predictable queuing behavior. Um, but you know, again, this is one of those cases where we don't have enough uh, data to really understand data center workloads to make it more of a definitive statement about that, just that there is a wide range of, of use cases where um, the speculative approach is possible and the network ordered approach doesn't have that bottleneck. So in your setup, do you have like a graph where you sort of increase the, the background traffic, which is actually foreground traffic, right? This right. is background, right? Right. Uh, where you increase it and then see what the impact is on speculative taxes? Yeah, such a graph definitely exists. I want to say that it's in the paper, but I can't say that for sure because it's been a couple of years. Uh, but definitely we've looked at that. And I'm happy to talk about that more. Yeah, Anirudh. So uh, did you implement the sequencer completely in software just to get an idea of like, what's the overhead of? Yeah, so we actually have also systems. built this with a completely software-based sequencer. And the, Interestingly, we didn't expect this to give you much of a benefit because the point of this work was to move something into the hardware. Right. It turns out that by using this uh, restructuring of the Paxos protocol in this way, you're able to get uh, essentially the same throughput benefit uh, with, with this, the software-based sequencer, uh, but not a latency benefit. So it winds up being you know, somewhere around here on the graph. And that's with you know no special hardware, just some network routing rules. Do you persist the commands? No, we don't. This is all in memory replication. All right, so. A question. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with this uh, um, state machine replication protocol clock, clock RSM? RSM? Um, no, I don't. So basically, what it does is. Uh, so if you have many replicas, what it does is every replica proposes with its own physical timestamp, mm -hmm. and that's the order. So that's, right. that gives you the order, and therefore you don't need even a leader in yeah. this case. So this is a bit older, I guess. I don't know if you have ever compared to it. Or... Uh, we haven't compared to it. I think even with a pre-ordering based on network clocks, you still have to do some amount of coordination to make sure that everyone agrees on which requests they have, not just the order. Uh, so you're not able to get to... So it's similar in the sense that you, you, so you get this proposed messages or mm -hmm. with a physical timestamp and also with a sequence. And as in your protocol, you can know which, which messages you, you have lost and which ones to request again. I, I think it's pretty similar, but... Yeah, maybe we can of, talk a bit more about this of offline. The, of the sequence. So just to summarize, this was a new approach to state machine replication that's co-designing distributed systems in the data center network. In the, in the common case, for speculative Paxos and with a guarantee in, in no Paxos. And these are able to give us gr nice improvements in replication performance without having to trade off consistency for, for it. I want to briefly mention, uh, since I know I'm running out of time, some of our current work. Uh, more to talk about what the problem is than the actual solution. But We've seen that this co-design approach can make fault tolerance fast. We're also using this to tackle the harder problem of making distributed transactions fast. So we were talking before about making copies of the data on a single server 
but we know that applications have way too much data to actually fit on one server, so we have to partition it into multiple shards, each of which gets assigned to a server. And actually, we want each shard to be replicated across multiple servers, so that means when we've got multiple requests coming in from different users, each of which that wants, wants to modify data on different shards at the same time, we've got a complicated coordination problem to deal with here of making sure that app operations get applied in the same order across different shards and on the replicas within a shard. So distributed transactions are a great abstraction for doing this. We get to group a bunch of operations together, even when they touch multiple shards, and then the transaction protocol is going to be responsible for applying them atomically to all of the shards. And the goal here is to provide a strict serial order of all transactions, making it appear as though they were executing one at a time on a single machine, so users don't have to worry about a lot of concurrency issues that come up. And there's a lot of demand for this kind of functionality, like Google migrating all of their advertising data towards Spanner, a transactional storage system, specifically so that developers wouldn't have to deal with data consistency problems. So the reason why distributed transactions, which are a great and old abstraction, uh, aren't always used is that they can be really expensive. So the normal approach that's used in systems like Spanner is to use a two-phase commit protocol to make sure that transactions execute atomically on all the shards they affect. And this looks kind of like the coordination we were trying to avoid in Paxos. But the situation is actually a lot worse because each shard is itself replicated, which means we need to run Paxos at various times through this two-phase commit protocol to make the log records persistent. And that's not even all of it because for most of this time, we're going to have to hold a lock and prevent concurrent transactions from executing. And that's going to keep the system throughput low, in addition to all the latency we incur from this coordination. So what we're trying to get to in the system called Eris is something like no Paxos did for replication, where we just have a client send a transaction to all the replicas in all the shards it affects and have that transaction arrive in order. And then all the replicas will have to do is execute that transaction and respond to the client without even communicating with each other. So this is an ambitious goal, but it's, we're able to achieve it for a certain class of transactions in a new system we've developed called Eris. It's a transaction coordination framework for distributed databases that provides strict serializability. Eris gets named after the Greek goddess of discord or lack of coordination. And it's optimized for this class of transactions that I'll talk about in a minute called independent transactions. And it can execute them without having to do any coordination at all, which gives us no overhead from either two-phase commit or replication. So the approach we're taking, I'll just describe at a pretty high level, is to use some transaction techniques to reduce transaction execution to an ordering problem, and then use a more advanced version of the network ordering mechanism we used in NoPaxos to efficiently order those transactions. So we've got three insights that are making this possible. The first one is that we're dealing with two different coordination problems here, ensuring that different shards execute transactions in a consistent order, and ensuring that the replicas within a shard are executing transactions in the same order. And traditionally, these get handled by completely separate protocols. We use two-phase commit for one of them and Paxos for the other one. There's an opportunity to avoid wasted work uh, by using a unified protocol to do both coordination at the same, both pieces of coordination at the same time. This introduces additional complexity, but avoids some redundancy. And this insight actually came from our, an earlier project out of our group called Taper uh, that was doing this in the context of wide area transactions. The second trick we're using is to focus on a particular class of transactions, which we call independent transactions, which are stored procedures that get applied atomically uh, but don't have data-dependent reads. So you can't read a value on one shard and then use, write that value into a variable on another shard, but you can read or change values on different shards at the same time. Now, this is a restrictive model. It doesn't cover everything. But it is, in fact, useful for building uh, existing transactional workloads. We know this because we weren't the ones who came up with this. It actually came out of the HStore work at MIT 
although they were never able to actually come up with an efficient protocol that took advantage of it. Uh, later, the Granola Project at MIT did some work uh, using this model as well. The other thing about these transactions is that uh, we've shown in this, we've shown in the Eris work that you can actually use these as a building block to build up fully general transactions so that you can start with the independent transaction model when you have the, that for your workload, but provide support for other applications, uh, albeit at some additional cost. And finally, we need a new network ordering mechanism, kind of like NoPaxis, but a little more complicated. The challenge here is that transactions are a little more complicated than replication, which is to, because in the replication world, each of the replicas uh, was receiving messages with, was receiving all the messages in the system. That, which means that if it ever got messages one, two, and four, it knew it missed message three and could figure out what it was supposed to do as a result. In a transaction processing system, we don't have that benefit because that we might ask, you know, did we not get message three because it was a, a packet containing a transaction we were supposed to execute that just got lost, or was it a transaction that didn't affect this shard? So that makes it a lot harder to achieve this drop detection property that was so important in NoPaxos. So we've actually built a new version of network sequencing called multi-sequencing that extends OUM to this multi-shard model where the clients submit messages to a list of participating shards and the sequencer maintains a counter for each shard and stamps it with all of the appropriate counter values so that it, all of the shards can detect lost packets. And, you know, the really high-level summary is that uh, this lets you do this protocol uh, for Eris, just like we did with NoPaxos, where clients send the transactions using multi-sequencing, and the participating replicas just verify that it's the next transaction in sequence that they're supposed to execute, and execute it and respond to the client. There's a lot more complexity in how do you deal with packets that are lost and out of order, and I'm not even going to talk about that at all, other than to note that this all happens correctly and off the critical path. At the end of the day, we're able to give you better performance by avoiding this coordination. So uh, a traditional approach would use a combination of two-phase commit and Paxos along with locking. That's represented by this spanner dot here, uh, which is our version of the, the spanner protocol. Arist is able to give you a substantial improvement on workloads like YCSB uh, with transactions that uh, because it's avoiding all of this coordination. We're able to get a 17x improvement in throughput, um, close to a 90% reduction in latency. We also improve on existing protocols like Granola, which provided uh, the same transaction model we do, and Taper, which is one of our earlier pieces of work. The other cool thing about this is that we've also compared to a non-transactional unreplicated system that's giving you none of these consistency guarantees, and the performance is within a couple of percent of what we're able to get out of Eris. So that was a really quick summary of Eris. Uh, I don't expect you to have any understanding of how the protocol actually works, but the point is that we're able to use the same kind of technique that we used in NoPaxos to give us coordination-free execution for more complicated applications like transactional transaction processing as well. So I want to quickly wrap up by saying a couple of words about the future of the data center. Uh, I started out by mentioning that you know, our applications today are being deployed in data centers, and the key word in data center design is commodity, that these are existing serv off-the-shelf servers connected by a standard Ethernet network. So what is the future data center going to look like? Uh, this isn't actually my vision of the future data center. This is actually Chanel's uh, data center themed collection from the last Paris Fashion Week, um, in case anyone was wondering if the data center was in. Uh, it has a <laughs> broad appeal. Um, we're already starting to see in our data center that there's a lot more customized hardware. Uh, I talked to programmable switches. You know, of course, about FPGAs in the context of Catapult and things like that, along with other coprocessors. 
And we're increasingly seeing disaggregated resources where we just have a pool of CPU and memory rather than uh, discrete servers. We've also got a lot more challenges in the data center. Uh, we always have more data, but now we're also asking to do more complicated computation on it, uh, query processing, machine learning, not just looking up simple results. And we have less time to do it because we're deploying this in interactive applications where we've got a fixed latency budget. And that budget is only, applications are already starting to strain against that. And increasingly, we're moving towards new classes of applications like uh, virtual reality, where that latency budget only falls even lower. But the really nice thing about the data center environment is that there is the chance to look at all the different components of the stack and see how they'll work together. So in addition to distributed systems and networks, which we already saw, you know, there's going to be the need for operating system support for low latency and safe sharing of resources. Uh, we need to figure out how to manage resources and schedule things in order to take advantage of these new types of customizable hardware. And we're likely going to need application-specific insights and programming language techniques that help us get those insights from the application developers to the underlying systems uh, in order to take advantage of application-specific optimizations. So my group has been doing a lot of work in all of these areas uh, independently and at the intersection of them. But it's really exciting to think about the fact that we can now start combining these into a uh, full stack, uh, clean slate redesign of distributed systems for the data center. So just to finally wrap up, uh, the data center is the important computational platform we have to deal with. It comes with a lot of distributed systems challenges related to data consistency. But because we're doing this in the context of the data center, there are a lot of traditional powerful applications that are abstractions that are usually pretty expensive that we can implement with a low performance cost. And what's making that possible is this new approach of co-designing distributed systems and data center networks. We've seen a couple applications, but there are many more, I believe. So I'd be happy to take s some more questions. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering how, when you're sort of co-designing these things together, how has your approach to developing, but especially testing and debugging, changed compared to traditional distributed applications? So I think how we do testing and debugging for distributed systems is a pretty ill-defined area to begin with. Uh, there's actually the potential for this to improve the maintainability of systems uh, in one sense because you've got a simpler, you're factoring it into a simpler primitive that gets deployed in the network and something that relies on that in the distributed system. So if you can you know, capture this modularity, uh, you know, verifying them independently is one, one way to do that. But definitely, we care a lot about this question, and we don't have a great answer to, to this for distributed systems in general, let alone co-designed ones. I have a very simple knife question. Uh, do, you do, anything, do you do anything special to handle counter overflows, or do you treat them as failed? Uh, like, what, so you, you have all these sequencers. What happens when that sequencer overflows? Essentially, we, we use essentially the same um, technique we would use when we replace a failed sequencer. Yeah, yeah. And you could probably optimize it a little bit knowing that it's not an actual failure, but yeah. that happens sufficiently and frequently that there's not much to gain from that. Ricardo. So a lot of the work that you presented here essentially leverages uh, switch technologies that are coming up. Right. Um, to improve the distributed systems, right? Yes. If you had a say on what the, these switch designers uh, should build, what would you suggest? What would be the ideal scenario for you? So we would love to have more general purpose uh, programmability in these switches. I think the way I would describe the current state of the marketplace is that there is a lot of pressure on switch vendors to provide this kind of programmability just because 
there's a small number of, of actual silicon vendors and a larger number of uh, resellers who make actual hardware, uh, switch, actual switch hardware. And at the same time, nobody actually knows what this programmability is going to be used for. Uh, we're still collectively trying to figure that out. Uh, and to the, most people are thinking about this primarily in the context of traditional networking problems. Uh, but uh, there is less of an understanding of what you can do uh, where what the right use cases are at the application level. So uh, uh, there, th this is definitely the important question that we're asking, and I think we don't have enough experience with the uh, use cases yet to, to give a really informed answer. I think from you know, my perspective, uh, the big question is how much computation are you able to do uh, within the context of processing one packet, and how much state are you avail able to maintain? Uh, it seems likely that the amount of state you're able to maintain is going to be limited by hardware constraints, uh, because that has to be in very fast on-chip registers uh, or SRAM. But uh, the amount of computation is less, it's less clear whether there's a fundamental bottleneck there or uh, just no use case for it yet. And presumably you would want the, the data center's uh, network to be as flat as possible too, right? For right. speculative axles, otherwise you're going to impose a pretty heavy penalty to go up all the way to the root of the... Right. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that's making this possible is the fact that we have these new to flat topologies for data center designs. Any other questions? This all right. thing, this oh, thank you all for coming.